In today's class, we are discussing zeros of a polynomial. Then we are discussing the fundamental theorem of algebra. Then we are going to quickly recall remainder and factor theorem. And also we are going to discuss geometric interpretation of zeros. Did you get this? We have quite a lot to discuss today's class, right? First, we are going to start with zeros of a polynomial and then the fundamental theorem of algebra. Then remainder and factor theorem, both of them are proper nine standard topic, but it's very, very important in, uh, even in uh, this year. In fact, that is going to be important, okay? Even in 11th or 12th, everywhere we are going to use it, right? You see, addition, subtraction, you have learnt in your primary school. So did you stop using it afterwards? Are you not till now, till date, are you not using it? And are you not going to keep on using it forever? Same logic, okay? So once you learn something in mathematics, it's not like, okay, I have learned it and I'm going to forget it. So you will be using it forever, right? Same logic applies here. So remainder and factor theorem, even though it's nine standard topic, we're going to quickly recall. We're not going to spend so much time. We're going to quickly recall because it is extremely important even this year, okay? And geometric interpretation of zeros. That is the actual uh, 10 standard topic, okay? Starting with zeros, of a polynomial okay we are going to start with the definition of zeros of a polynomial the definition goes like this a number alpha is said to be a zero please understand i'm not calling this i'm not saying that the value of this number alpha is zero zero is the name i'm giving for this number alpha under a certain condition i'll tell you a number alpha is said to be zero of the polynomial P of x under what condition? If and only if P of alpha happens to be 0. Did you understand this particular statement? A number alpha, there is some number alpha. They don't say what kind of number it is. Whether it's a positive number, negative, rational, irrational, integer, or even non-real. Okay, whether it's even a real number or not, even that they don't mention. Okay, there is some number alpha and it is said to be a zero of the polynomial. Please understand, we are not at all claiming that the value of alpha is equal to zero. I'm not saying alpha is equal to zero. Zero is just a name that we are giving, uh, giving for that particular number alpha. Okay, so zero is just a name, zero of the polynomial. Don't just look at it like zero, it is zero of the polynomial. That is the name we give for this number alpha. Under what condition? Perfect, right? If you replace the variable x, x is the variable, right, of the polynomial. So if you replace the variable x with that chosen number, that number alpha, the value of the polynomial turns out to be zero, right? So this is how we define zero of a polynomial. And we're going to understand this better using the following examples, okay? Check this. Examples of zeros of a polynomial, okay? Check this one zeros of polynomial p of x is equal to x square minus x minus 12 are the zeros of this one particular polynomial are minus 3 and 4. The zeros are minus 3 and 4. Of course, neither minus 3 is equal to 0 nor 4 is equal to 0. Okay, so 0 is the name we are giving for that number minus 3 as well as that number 4. Why? What is the reason? The reason is perfect, okay? You replace in this polynomial. Listen, in a polynomial, you're free to replace the variable with any number you want. Always remember, in a polynomial, you are free to replace the variable with any number you want. Did you hear me? You can, you can replace it with any number you want. But there are certain numbers, some special numbers, when you replace that variable x with, it is going to give you the answer as zero. Those numbers are called as zeros. Okay, so for example, what is p of uh, minus 3 here? What is p of minus 3 here? p of minus 3 is what? Minus 3 square is 9. What is minus of minus 3? Plus 3. Minus 12. So what is 9 plus 3 minus 12? Of course, you're getting 0. Since this input is giving you the output as 0, that input itself is called as a 0 of the polynomial. Right? Okay, this is one uh, justification. What about 4? Consider p of 4. What about p of 4? Replace x with 4. When you replace x with 4, you get 16. 
exactly 16 minus 4 minus 12 that gives you what zero so it is that particular number which when you give it as the input the corresponding output turns out to be zero otherwise technically sp uh, speaking we are free to replace x with anything you want right i can replace x with anything i want there is no question about it okay i can i can find p of 1 what is p of 1 it is going to be 1 square is 1 minus 1 minus 12 so the answer is minus 12 okay i can find p of uh, 10 right i can find p of anything i can replace x with anything right in an expression always remember in an expression you can replace the variable with anything you cannot do so in an equation that's a different story but in an expression polynomial is basically an expression in previous class i have told you i was stressing so much on this there is a topic called as polynomial equation okay that we will worry about later but what we are studying right now is polynomial expression the word polynomial itself means polynomial expression okay so in an expression you have the freedom of replacing x with the variable with anything you want what is p of 10 here 100 minus 10 minus 12 what is it 78 is the point clear you are free to replace the variable x with anything you want but there are uh, some special numbers that when you replace x with it is going to give you zero those special numbers are called as zeros now why are we why are we so much into getting the answer is zero in what way these numbers are special that we will address later okay as we are like you know proceeding further with this particular concept okay you will learn more and more things about uh, zeros of a polynomial those numbers are actually something special you will understand this better once we pro you know proceed further and prove certain things about the zeros is that clear okay we'll see one or two more examples okay what about this zeros of q of x zeros of q of x q of x is x cubed minus 4x square plus x plus 6 okay the zeros are you know what are they minus 1 2 3 i'll give you reason i'll give you reason the reason is always very simple and straightforward you replace x with that number if it gives you zero then that number itself is called a zero right what is q of 1 q of minus 1 that is what is q of minus 1 what is cube of minus 1 minus 1 minus 4 times what is square of minus 1 it is going to be plus 1 so minus 4 times plus 1 is minus 4 only replace x with minus 1 plus 6 so what is it minus 1 minus 4 minus 1 is minus 6 plus 6 is 0 okay it works okay what if you give 2 here what is q of 2 8 minus 4 times 4 is 16 plus 2 plus 6 what is it 8 plus 2 is 10 plus 6 is 16 minus 16 is 0 what is q of 3 yeah 27 minus 36 3 yeah you see 27 plus 3 is 30 plus 6 is 36 and that is minus 36 it is 0 done so these three numbers are certainly the zeros of this given polynomial did you get this yeah one more example zeros of this polynomial r of x i told you yesterday only that p capital p capital q capital r or even small letters are fine p q r or f okay these are all just the names of the polynomials and whatever you see within the bracket denotes the variable of the polynomial right okay so zeros of the polynomial r of x what is r of x given to be x cube minus 3x square plus 3x minus 1 the zeros are what are they 1 is a 0 1 is a 0 and 1 alone is the 0 okay 1 alone is a 0 there is no other zero okay but i'm going to write one three times i'll justify okay we, we will discuss more about it later okay i'll justify what is r of one what is r of one one cube is one minus three plus three minus one so clearly they all will cancel and gives you zero but how do we know that one is the only zero why not there is any other zero the logic is r of x forget about this numerical work even otherwise r of x is basically x minus 1 the whole cube do you get this do you know a minus b the whole square sorry whole cube result all of you a minus b the whole cube result it's based on that x minus 1 the whole cube is x cube 
minus 3x square plus 3x minus 1. Okay. Now, cube of a number will be 0 if and only if what? The number itself is 0. Cube of a number will be 0 if and only if the number itself is 0. Is that point clear? So, cube of x minus 1 will be 0 if and only if x minus 1 is 0. So, x minus 1 is 0 means x is 1. There is no other number that you can replace x with so that the answer becomes 0. Is the point clear? And this x minus 1, the whole cube, is basically what? x minus 1 into x minus 1 into x minus 1. Okay? You see, had this been three different factors, for example, I'm telling you, had this been three different factors, what uh, we would have done? We would have equated this to zero. You will get one as one of the zeros. You would have equated this to zero. You would have written two as one of the zeros. You would have equated this to zero. You would have written three as one of the zeros. So you would be concluding that the zeros are one, two, and three. Had this been three different factors. But here, all the three factors are same, right? Hence, we say the zeros are 1, 1, and 1. Is that clear? I'll justify this uh, even better using the following theorem. Did you understand this? Here we say that the zeros are 1, 1, and 1. If you look at it like three different factors and you equate all those three different factors to 0, you will get x is equal to 1, x equals 1, x equals 1, three times you're getting. Right? Hence, we say that the zeros are 1, 1, and 1. Okay? So, did you understand the definition of 0 and these examples of zeros? Did you all get this? Now we are going to discuss something called as the fundamental theorem of algebra. Did you hear something very similar sounding in the previous topic, previous chapter? You know, what is it? No. We definitely discussed something very similar sounding in the previous chapter. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. I want you to respond, please. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic, don't you remember? Yeah? Any natural number can always be uniquely prime factorized. Okay? Except for the order in which the prime numbers occur. Do you remember this? And on that day, I remember, if you want, you can just uh, check your notes once again. That day, I remember, I told you that in your entire school life, there are three fundamental theorems that you're going to study. One is fundamental theorem of arithmetic that you studied last class. I mean, in the, in the previous chapter, I meant. And the second fundamental theorem is the fundamental theorem of algebra that we're going to study now. And the third fundamental theorem is the fundamental theorem of calculus. I told you calculus is something that you will study in 11th and 12th standard, particularly the fundamental theorem of calculus you're going to study in 12th standard. So in your entire school life, these are the three fundamental theorems that you're going to study. Do you remember I told you this? Yeah, so here we have, here we have the fundamental theorem of algebra. It is quite possible that you must have, uh, you know, heard about this before, just that you do not know its name. It's possible you must have heard about it before, okay, without knowing its uh, name. I'll give you the statement and we're not discussing the proof because the proof is uh, certainly out of our reach, okay. Uh, it has got plenty of different proofs, but all those proofs are way beyond our level, right. And the proof is not at all required, even from a uh, you know, board exam point of view, right? Okay, the statement goes like this. Any polynomial of degree n, preferably, we want that n to be greater than or equal to 1. We don't talk about degree 0, degree minus infinity and all. We are not basically dealing with constant polynomials, is what I'm trying to convey here. Any polynomial of degree n will have n number of zeros. Take your time. Read this. Any polynomial of degree n, and we want that degree to be greater than or equal to 1. The degree can be 1, 2, 3, 4, so on. Degree 0 is not allowed. You know, what is degree 0 polynomial? Constant polynomial. It's a non-zero constant polynomial. Yeah, non-zero constant polynomial. Degree 0 means non-zero constant polynomial. And uh, zero polynomials degree is uh, either not defined or it's uh, taken as minus infinity. So those two alone we will remove from this particular argument in this particular statement. Okay. Otherwise, a typical polynomial which is having a variable, the smallest polynomial which is having a variable is linear polynomial, then quadratic polynomial, then cubic polynomial, it goes on. The degree 1, 2, 3, 4 goes on. Right. So, you choose any polynomial of degree n where n is at least 1. Okay. That polynomial 
will have n number of zeros. It's guaranteed. Okay, the fundamental theorem of algebra guarantees that there are n number of zeros. FTA, in short, we call it, but even that is called as FTA, so don't get confused between these two. Okay, it's based on the context. Any polynomial of degree n will have n number of zeros. That is why you can go through these examples. You can go through these examples. Please understand, no matter how many examples you produce in favor of a statement, it's not counted as proof. I told you this enough number of times. No matter how many examples you produce in favor of a statement, it's not counted as proof, right? But we're not discussing the proof because the proof is too much for us. At least let's try to understand the same statement using some examples. What is the degree of this polynomial? What is the degree of this polynomial? Degree is 2. Are you getting it? The degree is clearly 2. And how many zeros are there? Two zeros are there. Yeah. What is that degree over here? What's the degree over here? 3. You see, degree is the highest uh, power among all the terms. Most importantly, the coefficient must be non-zero. So which is the highest power term having non-zero coefficient? 3, right? Degree is 3. How many zeros are there? Three zeros. Now here, the degree is what? Degree is what? Three. Now, do you remember? I told you that when you, you know, apply algebraic identity, we are getting R of X is X minus one, the whole cube. Do you remember that time just a while ago, I told you R of X is X minus one, the whole cube. Yeah. X minus one, the whole cube. So the only number that will make this polynomial zero is one. The only number that will make this polynomial a zero is one. Okay. So you could have simply said that the zero is one. You could have simply said that the zero of this polynomial is one, right? Why are we like saying the zeros are one, one and one? Why are we saying that? Okay. I also gave you this kind of justification. Don't look at it like X minus one, the whole cube. Look at it like, yeah, I told you. Don't look at it like x minus 1 the whole cube. Look at it like x minus 1 into x minus 1 into x minus 1. Had this been three different factors, what you would have done? You would have equated all these three factors to zero separately and you would have found zeros, right? So imagine we are doing the same thing here and you will get 1, 1 and 1. Now it is perfectly syncing with the statement of fundamental theorem of algebra. Is it now perfectly syncing with the statement of fundamental theorem of algebra? Yes or no? It's perfectly syncing with the statement of fundamental theorem of algebra. There are, the degree is three. Therefore, there are three zeros. Did you get this? If the degree is four, there will be four zeros. If the degree is 10, there will be 10 zeros. I don't know, first of all, whether you understood this. Do you understand this is X minus one, the whole cube? You tell me honestly, did you understand this is X minus one, the whole cube? You know, A minus B, the whole, whole cube result. Okay, so you understood it's x minus 1, the whole cube. Now, the only number, the only number that will make this thing 0 is what? 1. The only number that will make the 0 is 1. If I replace x with 1, what do I get? 1 minus 1, 0 cube is uh, 0. If I put 2 here, if I put 3 here, if I put uh, root 3 here, you put anything except for 1, it's not going to work. So, do you agree with me that 1 is the only 0? Okay. Now we could have said the zeros of this polynomial is one. We could have said that. Yeah. But why are we saying that the zeros of this polynomial are one, one and one? Why are we saying that? We know that there is only one zero. That is the number one. But why are we like counting that number one multiple times? Why are we doing it? The reason is only then it will perfectly sync with the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra guarantees that any polynomial of degree n will have n number of zeros. Is that clear? Any, any polynomial of degree n will have n number of zeros. This being a polynomial of degree what? 3. There must be 3 zeros. Now we accounted for only one zero that is number 1. Where are the other two zeros? The other two zeros also, it cannot be anything else. It has to be one only because except for number 1, nothing else will work. Okay, even though it looks kind of artificial, it is perfectly, you know, justifiable because, you know, what is the factorized form of this particular polynomial? You know, what will be the factorized form? How to find the factorized form? That's another long story. Don't worry about it. Okay, you know, what will be the factorized form of this particular polynomial? 
x plus 1 into x minus 2 into x minus 3. If you have any doubts, you can factorize this later. Not factorize, sorry, you can multiply this and verify this later. You know how to multiply, right, using distributive property, Pratibha? You know how to multiply using distributive property. I wanted to multiply this later. For example, first multiply these two using distributive property x square minus 3x minus 2x minus of minuses plus 6. You will get one answer. That answer you multiply with x plus 1. You will get this cubic polynomial. Right? Now, how do you find the zeros? You know, equate this factor to 0. What do you get? x plus 1 is equal to 0 means x is minus 1. Now, equate this factor to 0. What do you get? x minus 2 is 0 means what is x? 2. Finally, equate this factor to 0. What do you get? If x minus 3 is 0, x is what? 3. By equating individual factors with 0, that is how we are actually finding the zeros of the polynomial. Yes or no? So if this polynomial is actually x minus 1 the whole cube, you don't have to look at it like x minus 1 the whole cube. You look at it like x minus 1 into x minus 1 into x minus 1 and look at it like you're equating all these three factors with zeros and every factor if you equate it to 0, it will give you x is equal to 1. Again, it will give you x is equal to 1. Again, it will give you x is equal to 1. And that is why we are counting 1, that number, same number 1, we are counting three times. So I have given you two different types of uh, justification. One justification is the fundamental theorem of algebra. If the degree is 3, there must be three number of zeros. That is one justification. Another justification is, this is exactly what we used to do in all other problems. I'm just imitating the same process even over here. And it is clearly giving me one, one and one. It is giving me the same number, but we are counting it three times. Did you really understand this?